Um, uh, actually, it has sucked often in the past when I've done this kind of thing. So it's, uh, it's sucked surprisingly a lot. Uh, but maybe you guys are cool enough that it won't. It's not me that sucks, of course, ever. <laughs> That's, uh, so yes. That's so true. There you go. <laughs> uh, be careful how wise you are. <laughs> OK. So anyway, that's the uh, plan. Uh, feel, feel free to skip it. But if you just want to come ask questions, you know, technical questions, anything, I'll, I'll, I'll work them out. And that way it won't be an entire waste of time. But I won't cover any actually new material. So don't, don't, don't worry. Sorry about that. Um, OK, is this thing on? It's on. All right. So, uh, so today, um, well, let's get rid of this. How do I get rid of this again? Is it this button? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Right screen, no. Uh, okay, that's I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm, ju I'm trying to do the exact opposite of what I did. Uh, select, second, select the destination. Oh, there was something that happened first, which I just didn't even do. Um, uh, if I just press it again, will it, no, there's actually something wrong, it's getting worse. Oh, here, here we go. Uh, yay. Perfect. OK. So today we're going to do um, uh, projective geometry 101. So this is really an entirely self-contained uh, lecture. And we might do more, depending on uh, how much people Oops. Is that gonna? Is that gonna? Wait, what? No, what? What happened? Oh, no, that's now light. Uh, hmm. Let me go back to this thing. Oh, you, you got it then. Make sure. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Is that okay for the mic, or do I have to? Here, let me let me put it here. There we go. Okay. Um. And uh, I hope we have uh, plenty of motivation from the previous couple of lectures that uh, we're going to need to uh, be comfortable thinking in terms of twister variables and um, points and lines and planes and so on in uh, projective space. So um, that's what we're going to uh, that's what we're going to do today. And as I've said many many times, uh, the ideas are totally trivial. They go back to the well, they're they're simple but deep. They go back to the 1500s. Um, and uh, uh, they're all, in principle, contained in the first 30 seconds of the definition. Um, but the purpose of this lecture is to make you comfortable to live in projective space, because we're going to live in projective space for the rest, for a lot of the less, uh, rest of this uh, lecture. OK? So, so first, what are we talking about? Well, uh, one definition is, this, uh, is the space um, of lines through the origin, just real projective space. in n plus 1 dimensions or you could equivalently think of it as the space of n plus 1 dimensional vectors xi so i is going to run from 0 to n so it's n plus 1 dimensional xi uh, where we identify xi with any multiple of xi okay so this is the projective space pn Okay, so let's uh, start from the simplest and most familiar example of P1. So if we're talking about the space of lines through the origin in two dimensions, so here's my origin, here's, a, here's one line, here's another line, here's another line. So every thing in this space is some line through the origin in two dimensions. And again, the whole point is this identification means that I don't care about this point or that point or that point, am I, I identifying all these points? Or for that matter, any of these guys, okay? I just care about the entire line. So I only care about the ray, the whole, the whole line through the uh, origin. Okay, so now let's say you want to put coordinates on this space. 
obviously is a one-dimensional space. And a very n nice way to put coordinates on it is to just like choose this line. Okay? I'm going to choose that special line and just ask to see where that line intersects uh, all of these uh, rays through the origin that I'm talking about. Okay, so this is clearly intersecting in various points. Okay, and so when we want to visualize Pn, we can really think about it as points in real n-dimensional space. Okay, and uh, we just get them by these rays that pass through the origin intersecting this some plane that I'm choosing to cut all these lines with. In this case, it happens to just be another line. Right? And if we say this more algebraically, generically, whatever my x was to begin with. So let me say that my, uh, I'll just, I'll put in hats for a reason. So this is my, my uh, two-dimensional vector in this case. Well, I can always write this as being sloppy with whether things vanish or not. I can write it as uh, y hat times z hat over y hat. And so I'm, I, I'm identifying this with one z hat over y hat. And this is a variable that I'll call one z. So this is what we normally sloppily say that we can uh, use homogeneous coordinates so that's the sort of yz, but we can gauge fix this uh, rescaling in order to say set the top component to one, okay? And then so the one variable we have left is z, all right? And now what in this picture are we doing? It's like literally here. If this was the z hat axis and this was the y hat axis, right? Oh, sorry, the other way, the y hat axis and the z hat axis. I'm just setting y hat equals 1, right? So there it is, the line y hat equals 1. And see here are all these points. There are some representative for all those points that intersect this line somewhere. OK, is that clear? So that's the sort of very basic sense in which we go from, from points in n dimensions to lines in n plus 1 dimensions that intersect uh, an n dimensional plane. So what do we gain from this? Well, we'll come in a second. To, uh, we, we, we're going to see what we gain from it. Um, not so much in P1, although of course, of course we gain some it everywhere, but, but uh, where it actually originally came from was in P2 and higher, which we'll see in just a, a moment. But let's already in this example make some obvious remarks. Um, there is a natural sense that, that you know, if I want to, I have the space of all lines. If I do a two by two linear transformation on the ambient space, I'm going to just move the lines around. Okay, so two by two linear transformations act naturally on lines to give me other lines, right? So there's a natural SL2. There's an SL2 transformation on X, on the space of all these Xs. So it just sends Xi goes through some two by two matrix Lij, Xj. We might as well take the determinant of L equals one. If we don't take the determinant of L equals 1, then that part is just x goes to tx. And I'm just modding out by that anyway. Okay, so we might as well, uh, I'm identifying all those x's anyway. So this is a natural transformation that just moves points in P1 around. Okay? And you see, in this way of thinking about this, there's nothing to do. You're, you know, you're a school kid who knows about matrices. You can remember this, just two by two linear transformations. But if you insist on working with this gauge fixing where you've set something to 1, then it'll look like a slightly more interesting transformation. So let's see what it, what it looks like. Um, where did my eraser go? Oh, here. OK, so let's just uh, take a general 2 by 2 matrix. So I'm going to take 1, z goes to a, b, c, d, 1, z. So this is a plus b, z, c plus d, z, OK? So that's no longer in the form 1z. But if I want to figure out what this is doing in that gauge fixing, I just identify this with 1c plus dz over a plus bz. So this is our famous Mobius transformation. z goes to c plus dz over a plus bz. OK, but this fancier Mobius transformation that has this denominator is nothing other than the homogenization of the trivial 2 by 2 linear transformation on the whole space. Right? Now, 
Here, why do you care if you care about points on the line of a Mobius transformation? Okay, for fancier reasons we care if you know about conformal mapping, blah, blah, blah. You care about conformal field theories, but I'm talking to a high school student who doesn't care about any of those things, so we will, uh, uh, but anyway, of course, it, uh, it, uh, it does matter. Um, but, but we'll see a little more vividly in a second when we go to a P2, what these larger SL symmetries are uh, buying for us. All right, let me make now just a, uh, uh, a few little comments, another few, uh, uh, another few small, small comments. Um, uh, one of them is that, of course, these coordinates don't cover the entire space. And we see it, of course, in our picture. If I look at the lines through the origin, and here is the line that I was cutting with, then there is this line, which doesn't intersect that one. OK? And of course, that corresponds in this picture to z goes to infinity. OK, but that's purely uh, an artifact of my choice to, uh, to try to cover this whole space with one set of uh, coordinates. And for, for example, if I chose another way to slice all of them with this plane, then that would be perfectly fine. So, so finding, either specifying where they, uh, where they hit this line covers almost the entire space, but it misses this one point. That one's covered by giving this one. So those two charts cover all of P1. All right? So that's part of the point here, which again, in this one-dimensional example is a, a little bit trivial, but as part of the point of projective space, is infinity is not a special point. You don't have to treat infinity separately. You don't have to think about it. Um, in fact, the whole point is to be as dumb as possible. The, 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 the advantage of, of working projectively is you never have to think. You don't have to think about special cases. You don't have to worry about infinity. Everything is just uh, happens immediately um, when, when you work in this uh, larger space of lines uh, through the origin. All right, so we could spend longer talking about cross ratios, et cetera, et cetera, but, that's, uh, but we'll, you'll do some of that in the, uh, in the homework. So I want to move along. <coughs> so now let's talk about P2. And again, this is the sort of origin of the subject, both with mathematicians and artists who are trying to learn how to draw in perspective. So if you notice that the drawings got a lot better in the 1500s in Europe, it's partially because people were understanding uh, projective geometry. Um, so, so let's just do exactly the same thing. <coughs> now we're looking at x goes to tx, x identified with tx. Once again, I can use this to put x in the form like one, some two-dimensional vectors. I don't know, I'll call it little xy, or one little x, right? Some two-dimensional vector. <coughs> Let's actually now talk about, um, uh, since we just talked about it, what are we missing in these coordinates? What we're missing are the things uh, that have zero on the top. OK? Uh, and so what are they? Well, they're zero times some uh, y downstairs. But since I can identify, still identify y to ty, uh, this, for instance, I could put to like one little z at the bottom. Or more importantly, more invariantly, what's left that I'm missing is a line, is a p1 itself. OK? So what I'm missing is a line at infinity. Not a point at infinity, but a line at infinity when I, uh, when I choose these, uh, when, I, when I make that choice. This will become uh, more uh, concretely obvious in just, just a second, but just so uh, it's just a parenthetical comment for now. Again, the whole point is that we, don't, we can relax and not worry about infinity. Um, so let's, let's, let's relax and, uh, and see how, how it all takes takes care of itself. All right, so now <coughs> let's, so, um, but again, to visualize things in P2, you're just visualizing things on a plane. Just draw pictures on a plane. Just, uh, and the zeroth order point to remember every time any question in geometry you ever run into in life where a metric notion does not make an appearance, where you're not literally talking about distances. You can even be talking about volumes. We'll come back to that, okay? But when you're literally not talking about distances and angles, um, then, uh, then uh, you should not think in Euclidean terms. You should think projectively. And, uh, the, and as we'll see in a moment, um, 
uh, when, uh, yeah. So, okay. So, um, so let's see. Uh, so let's do some very basic things. So, so a point in P two. I'm just going to draw like a point is some x i. Now, how do we talk about uh, 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 how do we talk about a line? So the usual sort of school kid talking a way of talking about a line in two dimensions is it satisfies an equation like x plus b y plus c equals zero. Okay, so that gives me some line. Um, but how should we talk about it? How do we talk about this projectively? So you see there's always this annoyance that there's a coefficient of a and b and then there's a constant term. But this is really, this is really the same as ax plus by plus cz equals zero, right? Where I further identify x, y, z with any multiple of x, y, z, right? And so I can use that to, if I'm being anal, let me put hats there, right? I won't keep doing that. But if I do that, I can use this, uh, I can use my freedom to rescale z hat to one, and then I go back to the familiar form of the, of the equation. Okay, so, so what that means is that with these homogeneous coordinates, all we're ever going to do, um, a line is an equation that looks like Li xi equals zero. Now, in other words, if you give me Li, right, that's giving me the ABC, right, so uh, so Li specifies a line. All of the x's that satisfy this equation lie on a line, and what specifies the line is giving this L with a lower index. Right? Now, um, let's call this curly L. Okay? Now, I have uh, written it with a downstairs index because I have a symmetry under, I have an SL3 symmetry now on the space of all lines to the origin in three dimensions, or in this two-dimensional projective space, which is x to Lx. And then on the downstairs indices, as usual, it would go with the inverse matrix. Okay, so this is an SL3 symmetry, which naturally acts on the whole space, and we'll interpret it in a uh, we'll interpret what's important about it in a moment. Yes. Uh, oh no, sorry. Uh, it, it, there's a there's I, maybe I shouldn't say say the word symmetry. There's a there's a or if the symmetry on the whole set of objects the, the uh, under three by three linear transformations, the set of all lines through the origin in three dimensions map to the set of all lines through the origin in three dimensions. Okay, so I will interpret what these symmetries are in a moment. In the two dimensional language, these are the set of all the symmetries that map straight lines into straight lines. Okay, and the surprise is that that's larger than the symmetry that you naively thought it was. Okay, and that has to do with the fact that we don't have any such thing as parallel lines anymore. Okay, so I'm going to come to this whole point. Uh, in, in just a second. All right. OK, so um, uh, notice, by the way, that uh, this already this helps us understand the sense in which there's a line at infinity, because uh, uh, this is another parenthetical comment about infinity for now. Uh, when I make this choice where I say x equals 1x, one way of saying what I've done is I've made one of the components special relative to the other two. Right? So this is not treating all three components symmetrically. I'm breaking the SL3 symmetry in doing this. But I'm breaking it in a very particular way. It's like I'm specifying, this is my upstairs thing, I'm specifying a downstairs object that I can call L infinity, which is just like 1, 0, 0. The, the downstairs indices are 1, 0, 0. And what I'm saying is that L infinity i x i equals 1. Okay, So say if I do that, that forces the top component to be 1, and it leaves everything else alone. So what have I done? When I'm, when I'm making this choice, I am, I'm, I'm specifying some additional data to the problem, giving you some line at infinity. right? And it's a line because it has a downstairs index. Okay. So um, anything that you want to do in P2 that doesn't care about infinity, doesn't treat infinity as anything special, then 
Despite the fact that if you're writing coordinates and so on, you might find it convenient to do that, the, everything you do in the end, you should not see any line at infinity involved. So those things should just disappear. And we'll see that uh, quite explicitly in a moment. All right, but let's actually ask what subset. So this is, uh, now if the, this is just an analogy if you're, a, if, you're a, if you're a particle physicist. This is exactly like the Higgs mechanism, right? And in fact, this is the way that Felix Klein thought about projective geometry and the relation to all the other kind of geometries, uh, all the, all the uh, non-Euclidean non geometries that people were still worried about whether they made sense or not in the 1800s. Felix Klein thought about in this language that sort of presades the way we think about grand unification by, by 100 years. Um, he said, what we really have in projective space is this giant space, and it has an SL3 symmetry. But we can make some choices to say, no, I'm going to also say there's a fixed line at infinity. Right? So that's like, that's like a Higgs that's, uh, that's breaking the SL3 down to a subgroup that leaves that line at infinity fixed. Now, what is the subset of the SL3 transformations that leaves the line at infinity fixed? Well, it's SL2 in the lower block, and translations where you translate the top component by any multiple of the two bottom components. Okay? So, so there's a subgroup of the SL3, which is SL2 cross translations, just two-dimensional translations, that leave L infinity fixed. Those are the obvious transformations of the two-dimensional affine plane. So when we say affine plane, that's just, that's just words for saying the symmetries we talk about are SL2 and translations. So any picture you have in geometry, again, I'm not talking about distances. I could be talking about areas. We'll emphasize that uh, in a moment. But anything where I can do two by two linear transformations and also translate the law, right? All of those things are a subgroup of the symmetries of SL3 of the entire projective space where you're not changing infinity. You're leaving infinity alone. So by doing that, you're reducing to a smaller symmetry. right? So there's a larger set of things that, just like when we Higgs things, if you go to high energies and you ignore the Higgs web, <laughs> you can mix things into each other that couldn't be mixed before. There's similarly something going on here. There is a larger SL3 symmetry, which if, uh, it, which if I don't care about the line at infinity, or for that matter, if I allow the line infinity to move around, which is the same thing, just not treated as a fixed line, I see a larger symmetry. So what is the purpose in life of this larger symmetry? Well, it's exactly the following question. Um, let's, say, uh, you, let's say you want to know the question, what are the symmetries on the plane that transform straight lines into straight lines? The totally obvious answer is two by two linear transformations and translations. That you don't have to think, right? OK, however, that's not the biggest set of symmetries that map straight lines into straight lines. That's the cool thing. There's a larger symmetry that maps straight lines into straight lines. It's actually SL3, bigger than the naive one. Well, what is that SL3? Well, in this underlying picture, it's totally trivial. It's exactly like what, what, what we did before. Um, so let's, let, let's, let's see what it is. Let's write our, so let's write our one x. And now let me, let me do the most general SL3 transformation that I can do that I'll write like this. There's some block here, I don't know, I'll call it A. There's a vector B, some vector C, and some matrix, uh, I don't know, little l. Okay? Right, so I have this thing goes to 1x, which is equal to A plus B dot x over C plus this matrix Lx. And once again, if I want to homogenize, to bring back to this form to find the transformation on these x's, this would go to 1 C plus Lx over A plus B dot x. All right? And the top part is the obvious ones. The top one is translations and two by two linear transformations. The cool thing is that you can augment it by this bottom one, right? The analog of the denominator in the Mobius transformations. 
And this is a larger set of transformations that map straight lines into straight lines. It's not a linear transformation. It's just kind of cool. There's a nonlinear transformation that nonetheless maps straight lines into straight lines. Right? It must violate some property of the things that we know and love. So what, vi what property does it violate, do you think? Parallel lines aren't mapped to parallel lines. <laughs> okay. If you take two parallel lines, uh, they'll be mapped into lines that, that intersect. Again, just like in grand unification, uh, you have SU5 Higgs down to SU3 cross SU2 cross U1. Well, there's a larger SU5 symmetry. You think you have quarks and leptons. They have nothing to do with each other. But there's a larger symmetry that mixes quarks into leptons. Once you decide, once you see that you don't care about fixing that, the, the thing that broke the gut anymore. Right? Exactly analogously, parallel lines and non-parallel lines appear to be separate beasts that don't talk to each other, but they're actually mapped into each other by this larger transformation. All right. OK, so, um, but, so once you do a, just a few of these uh, little exercises with infinity, you just never have to think about it again. Okay? So, because all you ever do, we don't have to worry about any of these transformations, anything in the denominator. All we're going to do forever from now on are just simple linear transformations, linear algebra. Um, nothing, nothing, nothing fancy. All right, so now let's start having some, some, some fun. Okay, so, so some, uh, some, some payoff. Um, if you get absolutely nothing else out of this entire course, I hope after this lecture you'll, you'll never do linear algebra stupidly ever again. Okay, so so um, let's say uh, uh, I'm given two points, um, I don't know, A, I, and B, I. Okay, any two points determine a line. Okay, so there's some line. So what is that line? I want a formula for that line. And here is the rule. The rule when, you're, when, you, when you work with this stuff is do anything you can with the objects that gives you something with the indices in the right place, and that's the right answer. <laughs> okay? And then, of course, you can go back and check and then figure out that it's, that it's true after a little bit of practice. These things are all quite, at this level, they're quite trivial. But we'll see slightly more interesting examples in a second. So what am I trying to get out of this data of an A and a B? I have to get something with a downstairs index. Right? So I have to somehow get a line L. L is going to depend on A and B with a downstairs index. My symmetry is SL3. The only tensor I have is the epsilon symbol. What can I do to make something with a downstairs index with two things with an upstairs index? Well, I just epsilon them. So epsilon I, J, K. A, J, B, K. Okay, so that's the line that passes between two points. Uh, we can check very easily that it is the line because L dot A is equal to L B equals zero, right? Because I'm contracting something with itself. Excellent. Okay, well, let's now do it backwards. Let's say you're given any two lines. L1 and L2, or uh, LA and LA and LB. So this is LAI, LBI. They're going to intersect in a point that I can call X that depends on these lines A and B with an upstairs index, and of course, just exactly the same thing with upstairs indices. OK? And again, here's the tiny payoff again. We do not have to talk about parallel versus not parallel. Any two lines, just like any two points define a line, any two lines define a point. Okay? And all that's happening when the lines are parallel is if you have a line at infinity that you care about, which you may or may not have, but if you have a line at infinity, so here's a line at infinity. You just literally draw it as a line. You don't have to put it at infinity or anything. You just literally draw it as a line. So what does it, what does it mean when the lines are parallel? It means that the intersection, so generically, here's two lines. They intersect here. But it might just so happen that the points where the two lines meet are at infinity, or on the line at infinity. Okay? And when that happens, we would say the lines are parallel. Okay? But it's an arbitrary idea, depending on what I meant by uh, infinity. You give me an infinity, it gives me a notion of parallel. If that happens, they're parallel. Otherwise, uh, they're not. Okay. So now we've restored the symmetry between points and lines. Any two points define a line. Any two lines define a point. We'll come back to that symmetry in, in a little bit. But I want to keep playing. 
because uh, this is really all the practical stuff you need to know how to do. It's all extremely simple, but let's just play some more. So uh, let's say I have two points, one and two. They're going to define a line. I have another two points, three and four. They're going to define another line. And so those two lines are going to intersect in some point, sort of x here. right? Now I want a formula for the intersection point. Okay. Well, I know in principle how to do it. Uh, 1, 2. I first make 1, 2. Then I make 3, 4. Then I have to epsilon, epsilon them all together. And then officially, you would sit there and play with your epsilon identities to get the answer. Okay. And that's completely correct. And all I'm doing is telling you how to think about those epsilon identities. All right. But here's the answer with no thought. So let me just write it down. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, minus 2, 1, 3, 4. So let me be x1i, x2, x3, x4, minus x2i, x1, x3, x4. And again, uh, what are in the brackets here? We're always, every time I see a bracket, everything is being contracted with an epsilon symbol. <clears throat> okay, so um, how do I know that that is the answer? Well, let me first do let me first do a quick uh, check on it. Um, uh, for instance, well, let me actually forget. It's it's easy enough that I can just tell you how to how to think about it. Remember, we had our uh, we had our uh, Kramer, Pluker, Schouten child linear algebra identity for any vectors in any space. Okay, so if I have four vectors in a three-dimensional space, they satisfy a linear relation. And the linear relation looks like this. It's x1, and then we just alternate here, right? Minus x2, 1, 3, 4, plus x3, 1, 2, 4, minus x4, 1, 2, 3, equals 0. Okay. Now, you can think of this uh, relation in many ways. One way, kind of the way you might derive it, is you say, ah, this tells me how to express x1 as a linear combination of x2, x3, and x4. OK? So if you take this four-term identity and break it up as 1 equals 3, it tells you how to express a point as a linear combination of the other points. Right? So for instance, that's telling you these are points on the plane. You know, here's a point 2, 3, 4. Maybe here's a point 1. It's telling you how to write that point as a linear combination of 1 is a linear combination of 2 plus 3 plus 4. Okay. All right. But you can also think of this identity in terms of these two equals these two. OK, and this is kind of cool. This is telling you there are some linear combination of x1 and x2 that is equal to some linear combination of x3 and x4. Okay? Now, any linear combination of x1 and x2 lies on the line joining 1 and 2. Any linear combination of x3 and x4 lies on a line joining x3 and x4. Right? Um, and so, um, <coughs> and so uh, this is telling us that this is a point on the line 1, 2, which is also a point on the line 3, 4. Therefore, it's the intersection. And so you see, I could also write this. So but the, the, the quick way of remembering it is that um, I want to do something with 1 and 2. It has to be anti-symmetric in 1 and 2. And so here's an expression, anti-symmetric in 1 and 2. right? And it treats 3, 4 just together as the line. Okay? So, so 3, 4 occur together in the combination x3, x4 all the time. And of course, I can write this the other way. I'm, I'm going to screw up the sign, but probably but I can write it as x3, x4, x1, x2, minus x4, x3, x1, x2. Yes, sorry, Lisa, I think you, you had a question. Uh, well, no, it, it's saying for, for, these, for these particular 
uh, for this particular vector. Just saying, it's possible. It's possible to write some four vector. Uh, uh, it's possible to write some three vector as a linear combination of any given set of three vectors. Um, of course, what that linear combination is depends on the vector. And in that sense, yes, it is. This is a non non nonlinear formula in all of them. But but it's just the linear algebra statement that it's possible to write a vector as a linear combination of, of the other vectors. Right. Okay. Is that clear? So in fact, every one of these formulas, and we'll do uh, other examples in a second, uh, the, 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 the basic formula that, ex that expresses a linear dependence between guys can be thought of a point as a combination of these guys, a line inter intersecting a plane, another plane inter intersecting a plane. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll see that uh, more explicitly um, as we go along. But uh, those will become fun in, in, higher, uh, in P3 and higher. But um, Oh, a few more, more basic things um, I should have said before. So let's say I have any three points, uh, x1, x2, and x3. OK, in general, they might be in some general position like that. Um, but what special thing happens when they lie in a line? When the three points are collinear, it means that this bracket, x1, x2, x3, equals 0. Right. That just says that x3 lies on the line 1, 2, okay. or, there's a, or that they're all, uh, uh, they're all linearly dependent. Everything we're going to see involving these objects involves these brackets, nothing else. We see nothing other than the epsilon symbol. Everything involves brackets. And brackets vanishing are just statements of incidence. Okay. So things lie on a line and so on. So what happens when three lines, L1, L2, L3, pass through a point? I forget what that's called. Is it called concurrent or something? This is collinear. I forget what this is called. Um, anyway, when that happens, the epsilon involving the lines is 0, and so on. All right. Now, um, we're not going to use, it'll come up, it might come up now and then. Um, <coughs> but just, uh, just uh, so we have a, a little more fun and just to force you to get more comfortable with it. Um, Let's talk about conics. All right, so um, what is the general formula for a conic? Well, it's ax squared plus bxy plus cy squared plus dx plus ey plus f equals 0. And how do we think about this now more projectively? We just put z's everywhere. So there's a z, z, and a z squared. Okay. Now this is a homogeneous formula that I can homogenize by setting z to 1. Right. So that means that a conic is nothing other than a symmetric tensor with two downstairs indices. Okay. So cij, xi, xj equals 0. Okay. So all the x's that satisfy that equation are the points on a conic. And to specify a conic, you have to give me a Cij, which is a symmetric 3 by 3 matrix. Now, how many degrees of freedom are there in a symmetric 3 by 3 matrix? Six. Right. Um, but everything here is projective, so everything is identified up to overall rescaling. So how many degrees of freedom are there are needed to specify a conic? Five. So amongst other things, that, that tells you if you give me five points, it's, they're going to determine a conic. So these kind of trivial countings, you don't have to visualize or think about how points lie on, on parabolas and hyperbolas and so on. Okay, so any five points determine a conic. We'll, we'll come back to that in a second. But again, let's just have some, uh, some fun. So far, you're probably not too impressed. OK, big deal. We're just doing lines, intersecting lines. I know how to solve two equations and two unknowns, um, three equations, three unknowns, whatever. That's fine. All right, so let me try to impress you more. So let's say someone hands you a, a conic, C. They hand you a point on the conic, x star. So this is some Cij. They hand you a point on the conic, x star i. And now what is the natural question that I could ask? What is the tangent to the conic at that point? So this is a line, right? All right, so OK, at least now I would start getting slightly scared. Maybe differentiate something, pretend that I know how to do it fast, and uh, right? Uh, slightly, slightly scary. So, what is the tangent to the what is the tangent to uh, the conic at x star? What is our rule? 
do anything you can with the right indices, right? So I need something with an upstairs, with a downstairs index. Well, there's only one thing I can do. And this line is indeed cij x star j. It's really cool, right? OK. Now, let's, let's go backwards. So presumably, anything that I can do that has the right indices has to be interpreted somehow. So let me, let me take this conic again. Give me some random point up, up here, x, not on the line. Not, not on the conic, OK? Well, I can build a line out of these guys, c, i, j, x, j. This is some line. This is a line. Who is this line? Who do you think this line is? Anyone have a proposal for what this line is? Huh? Closest, ha ha, you see? You have, you, I'm so mad at you, okay? <laughs> I cannot tell you how upset I am with you. That, uh, don't even talk to me, okay? But the word closest, closest. What, closest, are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm joking, I'm not joking that much, actually. That's, uh, no. Uh, uh, no, there's no metrics here. There's no metric notions at all. Nothing to do with closest, no metric notions at all. What can you do in this picture that involves no notion of metric, no, no nothing? Yes? Yes, good. That's one line. By the way, there's the other one. Keep going. That's the line, okay? <laughs> right? That's super cool. You want to know what you get. You have a conic, you have a point. What is the line? Which is the one you get after you draw two tangents and then you draw the line between them? You don't think. You just do the only thing you can that has the indices in the right place, okay? Now let's have a little more fun. Let me look at the equation. Um, let's say there happen to be a pair of points, x and y, such that cij x, i, y, j equals 0. So let's say I have a pair of points that satisfy that. Right? So what does that mean? That means, so we've just learned what it means. So we have this guy, here is x. I draw these two tangents. I make this line. That equation means that y is somewhere on this line. OK? But of course, I could also read it backwards. I can say that x is on the line made out of y. So that's a small, cool theorem in geometry that you can very easily prove otherwise. But it's sort of nice to see it so trivially here that if y lies on this line made out of the x's, then x lies on the line made out of the y's. And you can see it in that picture. OK? So these are just little examples of how trivial it is to do geometry problems when you think projectively. Yes? Yes? Sorry? Oh, inside, outside means nothing here. So that's, that, that's, that's the other thing. Uh, uh, th that, that is the other thing. Uh, if, we want to, if you want to uh, get the right answer for everything, just draw the most generic picture you can in real space, OK? Um, and uh, everything will be fine. Of course, ultimately, there are quadratic equations involved. There may be complex roots and so on. Right? But if you draw a generic enough picture where you're not artificially making something look like a hyperbola or things go off in some direction and, and so on, uh, then um, you're always going to get the right counting, the right, the right answer to any question. But in, in principle, once you get beyond uh, linear equations, there may, be, there may be roots. The equations are algebraic. And so you have to, uh, uh, it's natural to think about them in the uh, complex. Okay? Yeah, so, um, OK. Now, so all of these things are, are trivial, uh, are essentially trivial. They're just sort of uh, fun. Uh, and they're uh, good to get, get used to playing with these things. But let me actually just tell you a few non-trivial things. Um, I highly recommend uh, all of you to buy, uh, or get from the library, if they still exist, um, David Hilbert's beautiful book called Geometry and the Imagination that was written sometime in the early 1900s. Um, this, is, this is a book, I don't know exactly who it's targeted at. I think it's like lay people, 
who really like math a lot, I guess. <laughs> okay, so, uh, but it's a spectacular book on uh, uh, a, a huge amount on the kind of projective geometry that I'm, I'm talking about. And Hilbert calls what I'm about to tell you the first non-trivial theorem in geometry. Okay. Essentially, everything so far has been follows from definitions, and we're just trying to understand things. How to, but this is the first non-trivial theorem in, in geometry. And uh, I will not prove it for you, but in fact, using these kind of methods, you can verify that they're true just with doing no work, some algebra, shove something in Mathematica, press return, get zero for some expression, and see that it's true. Okay. So the whole point is that you can just trivially algebraize uh, thinking about these kinds of, uh, of problems. So let me just tell you what they are. Um, and they go back over 2,000 years to uh, some guy called Pappus, um, who apparently noticing patterns of shadows cast by olive trees in olive groves somewhere in Greece, made the following observation, that if you take uh, two lines and you have three points on one line and three points on another line, and you just join these, uh, you just join these points up in a hexagonal pattern any way you like. So like one, uh, I'm just doing it so that I always draw it so it doesn't work. So I'm just trying to make sure that I draw it so it does work. Okay, so draw, join them up like that. Okay, so you see there are these three intersection points inside here. And Pappus noticed that these lines, these three points are collinear. Okay, so that's Pappus' theorem. And how do you prove this? How do you check that it's true? Well, you just give these things names. One, two, three, A, B, C. So you have to look at the line. One B intersect two A. One C intersect three B. Two C intersect three A. And look at the epsilon symbol of all of them, and it's zero. Right, so that's an identity involving uh, these three brackets. Remember, there is an identity involving these three brackets, which is, comes from that basic four-term identity, right? the uh, plucker schouten kramer relation. Right? And, uh, and this fact follows from those relations. Um, you can also, uh, but if you don't want to, uh, you, if you don't want to see them following from any relations, you just plonk them down on these lines, just in the way I, I described. You take a point 1, 2. You write 3 as any linear combination of 1 and 2. You take another random point, A, B. You write C as any linear combination of A and B. You shove it on the computer. You press return. You get 0. Okay. Yes? Sorry? Uh, there, um, did I? Uh, uh, well, let's see. That, that's why I did it this way. Let, let me let me draw it. Let me draw it better. So, it, it's the ones that are associated with the uh, with the hexagonal pattern I was attempting to draw. So, if you take one, two, three. In fact, there are many other intersections that you could talk about. One, two, three, A, B, C. It's one B, two A, two C, three B. 1c, 3a. Okay. So these three points find a line. And actually, uh, Pascal, I think when he was 16 years old, generalized this. The more general statement is exactly the same thing as true if you have six points on a conic. So if you draw exactly the same thing with 1, 2, 3, and a, b, c, the picture before is a special case where the, where the conic degenerates into, th into two lines. But if I take exactly the same thing and draw exactly the same set of lines, 1b, 2a, 2c, 3b, 1c, 3a. Uh, now, this really looks bad, but these are supposed to be on the line. Okay. Now, something that I'll ask you to do on a problem set is to uh, answer the following question. Um, related to all of these things. Uh, given five points, there are some conic. So given any five points, x1i through x5i, there are some conic cij that you can build 
that all of these are on the conic. Okay? So five points determine a conic. So out of these things, there is some interesting way, quite a bit more interesting than what we just did, uh, of building something with two downstairs indices that have all of them on it. Right? So um, uh, there's an extremely simple way of thinking about uh, uh, how it arises, is that you'll do that on the, uh, on the problem set. But one consequence of it is the following. And again, there, there are lots of uh, identities like this. But now these are actually non-trivial non statements, more non-trivial statements. So let's say someone hands you six points. And you want to know, are the six points on a conic? So in fact, what I just told you, Pappus, or the more general statement of uh, Pascal, is a necessary and sufficient condition for six points to be on a conic. So if someone hands you six points and you want to know, are they on a conic? Instead of going and drawing some curvy shape that goes through all of them, you can just draw a bunch of straight lines <laughs> and check if it's true. So it's, it's, it's quite, quite cool that you can do that. Right? But, uh, but given six points, x1 through x6, six points are on a conic if and only if the following interesting object is 0, s123456, which is And I'll ask you to, and, uh, and I'll tell you how to go about checking this. So this is now an interesting quartic invariant made out of the minors. Okay? There's an interesting quartic invariant in all the minors that vanishes if and only if uh, the six points are on a conic. And on the problem set, you'll understand why it had to be quartic, how you find it, and so on. The cool thing about this is that uh, this object uh, is actually completely permutation invariant up to sign. Okay, so if you interchange the indices uh, at all, it just picks up the order of the permutation. It picks up a minus sign if you uh, interchange any two. Okay? But otherwise, it is invariant. It's not obvious from this way of writing it. Okay? This way of writing, in fact, only manifests a cyclic symmetry. If you shift everyone over by one, it clearly goes into itself up to a minus one. right? Um, and the fact that it's indeed permutation invariant is another identity that follows from these nonlinear identities that the, uh, that the brackets satisfy. Really, the point, like Lisa was emphasizing, these identities are very nonlinear. <laughs> they're, 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 they're the fact that, there is a, that for any given vector you can write as a linear combination of vectors, that's trivial linear algebra. The dependence on how you write it in terms of what the vectors are is a very nonlinear uh, set of identities. These are these Pucher relations, these quadratic relations. And you can use the Pucher relations um, to show that this is, in fact, totally permutation invariant. Okay? All right, a few more general remarks. Um, so any questions? Any questions about any of this so far? I, I, I encourage you, well, after we do some P3 examples, you should just go do many of these things uh, for fun uh, yourself. Um, but. Uh, <coughs> But let me make a, a few more uh, general remarks here already in P2. Um, first is that there is uh, something that, from, from the notation we're using, is totally obvious, but is still kind of amazing. Um, there's a duality here. There's what you can call a projective duality. I don't know what its official word is. Okay. So what is this duality? This is, a, this is the statement that any statement in projective geometry, let's say in P2, any statement in P2 that uses the words lines, points, lines, any such statement, if you just reverse point with line and line with point, this is also a true statement. So we can just in, totally interchange the role of points and lines, and, and uh, any statement that was true before is true afterwards. Now, why is that blindingly obvious from our notation? That's just raising and lowering indices. <laughs> right? I said that a point had something with an upstairs index, a line with something with a downstairs index. Well, that's totally conventional. Okay, I could, I could, uh, uh, so this is, the, uh, this is the fact that I could use L or L inverse. Okay, so this is just uh, upstairs versus downstairs indices. Okay, but it's still slightly interesting. Well, the most trivial examples are any two points determine a line. If in that statement, I reverse the words line and point. I also get a true statement. Any two lines determine a point. 
Of course, we have to work in projective space for that to be true. Okay? Um, but the more fancy statements are also true. I invite you to take Pappas's configuration and reverse points with lines. You get a very different looking <laughs> problem, and uh, the statement is still true. Uh, what is the dual of Pascal's theorem more generally? The dual of Pascal's theorem is something that uh, it may be slightly more familiar. You may have seen in uh, high school. I forget what it's called. It's called Des Arcs theorem. I forget what it's called. Anyway, the dual of Pascal's theorem is that if you take a conic inscribed inside a hexagon, one, two, three, four, five, six, and now I look at the lines going through the opposite corners, ah, that worked. Okay. That they meet, that they intersect at a point. So this is the dual of Pascal. And I, I invite you to just check that that follows by interchanging points and lines. By the way, what do conics go, in, go uh, undo into dualities? Conics go into conics. Okay. So points go to lines, conics go to, go to conics. OK? Yeah. Well, uh, everything is true in R2. The only, thing, the only thing that's wrong with R2 is that there are always stupid exceptions. All they could go to infinity, right? So that's, 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 that's what I'm saying. Any question in geometry that does not involve a metric, think projectively and you will win. <laughs> okay? And then you don't have to think and worry about uh, so, um, yeah. So, and the way to visualize it is in R2. Okay? So just think, think in uh, R2, but don't draw accidentally parallel lines. Okay? And that, at least for me, is a challenge when you start having enough points around. Whenever I try to draw something generic, it always ends up looking like a regular n-gon, and all the points I'm interested in are intersecting at infinity. So that's, uh, again, the wisdom of uh, consistency being the hobgoblin of mediocre minds. All right. Very good. So now let's uh, move on to P3. Now P3 is where we're, we're going to be spending a lot of time in, in, in higher projective spaces too, of course. But P3 is where the momentum twisters live. So this is going to be especially uh, important. But, okay, but now, now everything is P3 and Pn in general. Everything is, is kind of uh, trivial. So let's do some examples in P3. So we have Xi upstairs. These are points. Um, what do I have downstairs is a plane, hyperplane, H, right? So this is a two-plane, right? So Xi is a point. Hi with the downstairs index is, is a, is a two-plane. So for instance, if you give me any three points, A, B, C, they determine a, some two-plane that they lie on. Right? And so what is that two-plane? Well, it's h lower i is epsilon i, j, k, l, a, j, b, k, d, l. Right? So again, same thing. You just wedge them together the only way you can. All right, so, and of course, I could also write this just by raising with an epsilon symbol. I could also write this as h, uh, j, k, l. Same thing, right? Just raising and lowering with the epsilon symbol. And this is actually kind of a useful way of thinking about things in general. And Pn is we can think in Pn, we can think about tensors with an upstairs index as being a point. Two anti-symmetrized upstairs indices would now be what? This would be a line something made out of two points. Three upstairs anti-symmetrized indices is a two-plane, and so on. Okay, so in general, something with j plus one anti-symmetrized indices is a j-plane. And of course, I can also think of them with all the indices downstairs. Okay, so I can dually think of this as something with an x with a bunch of indices downstairs, and I won't, I won't keep, keep writing it. Okay, so just, just fewer and fewer indices, uh, just the conjugate of all these indices downstairs. OK. So, so indeed, if I'm back in P3, uh, three points determine a plane, two points determine this line. So if I give you an AI and a BJ, an AI and a BJ, 
there's a line L with two upstairs indices IJ, which is AIBJ minus AJBI. Um, now, um, so what, what, what can we do with these? So, so if, you, if you give me one line L1, another line L2, in general, they're in general position. I don't know anything about them. But what does it take for the lines to intersect? The lines intersect on a plane, L1 and L2. They intersect on a plane when, uh, when uh, L1, Ij, L2, Kl, epsilon Ij, Kl equals 0. So we could also, so, and we talked about this last time. If I happen to label the points on this guy as A, B, two points on them and two points on this guy as C, D, then that's saying it's when now this four bracket, A, B, C, D equals 0. OK, but now let's do some more of our kind of intersection problems. This is the thing that you practically need to know how to do. Okay, so let's do some more of our little intersection problems. So uh, let's say I have a plane. I have two planes. So that's first a, a, dumb, a dumb case. So let's say I have a plane H1, and I have some other plane H2. I want to know they intersect on a line. Okay, so what line do they intersect on? Well, it's exactly what we did before, right? Now, now it's of course convenient to describe the line with downstairs indices. The line with downstairs indices is h1 i h2 j minus h2 i h1 j. Okay, so again, always anti-symmetrized. Okay, so we're always wedging things. Uh, we're always wedging things together. So that's the that's the line. That's the intersection of the two planes. Okay, let's do another problem. Let's say someone hands you three points, one, two, three, that determine some plane. And they hand you two other points, four and five, that determine a line. And I want to know, where does the line four, five intersect the plane one, two, three? Okay, or where does the plane one, two, three intersect the line four, five? And we already. This is exactly the, the general strategy that we did before. We have that now five-term relation. We can interpret that five-term relation as how to write one point as a linear combination of four, two points as a linear combination of three, three points as a linear combination of two, and so on. Right? So, so one of those identities tells me what the intersection of this line four, five is with the plane one, two, three. And so that point is nothing other than four, five, one, two, three, minus five, Four, one, two, three. All right. Now that presentation is is particularly useful if you're really interested in where it is on the line four, five. Right, because it tells you exactly what linear combination of four and five it is. Let's say you care more about exactly where it is on the plane one, two, three. Well, use the other representation. So this is also equal to, and I'm going to get the sign wrong, but anyway, one, two, uh, one, two, four, five, minus two, one, four, five, plus three, uh, one, four, five. Okay, sorry? Uh, yes, they most certainly should. One, and that explains why I was confused, <laughs> minus two, one, three, four, five, plus three, one, two, four, five. Thank you. Okay, and again, we're always rearranging. So that one identity just tells us about the intersection of any two planes whose dimensionality adds up to n plus 1. Right? Let's do a slightly more fun exercise, very slightly more fun. Um, I mean, we've, we've basically done it already. but. Uh, just, just so we have uh, sort of practice doing it like this. Let's say I give you uh, an A, B, and a C that defines some plane. I'll just call it A, B, C. And an X, Y, and a Z that define a plane X, Y, Z. And I want to know 
again, what is the intersection of this plane ABC intersects XYZ? So this is a line. OK? And now, how are we going to get this line? Now we're going to have to get something that has two upstairs anti-symmetric indices, right? And so what is it? Well, again, we can think of it in exactly the same way, all the ways we've done, but let's just uh, now uh, let us write down the answer. I want something with two upstairs indices. So I'm going to have A, A, I, B, J, anti-symmetrized here, times C, X, Y, Z, minus A, I, C, J, anti-symmetrized B, X, Y, Z, plus B, I, C, J, anti-symmetrized A, X, Y, Z. Okay, so it's always the same. When you intersect these things, you can think of it from the frame of one of e one or the other of the objects who is being intersected and write any expression that treats all of them, uh, all the other ones together in one block and just appropriately takes pieces of the guys of the plane that you're interested in expanding then and makes the appropriately anti-symmetric object. Okay, so, right? That's what it is. That's all we're doing, right? So, uh, so that, that's 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 what I said, and and you should do that, and I'll force you to do it on the problem set to do some of these things in the official epsilon way. Officially, it's just the big epsilon, and all you have to do is take the epsilon identities and contract things. That's all we're doing, right? I'm just telling you how to think about it so that uh, so that you can you can do it lickety split, okay, and not uh, and also see what's going on and why it's true. Okay. All right. So. Um, OK, I have a few more minutes, so um, let me uh, tell you a few other things we're going to need. And actually, I think I can actually finish most of the things that we're, gonna, we're going to need. And uh, perhaps on Tuesday, we can do lots more examples if, if people want. Um, um, <clears throat> so now I want to talk about um, uh, the notion of a volume, area volume in projective space. And actually, um, the notion of a volume does not make sense in projective space by itself. But it also doesn't need a metric. Okay? It does not need as much as a metric. The notion of a volume is an affine notion. So what I mean by affine, I mean, you think in the, uh, again, in the dumbest way, an area made out of two vectors is a cross product. The, the, the determinant, that's invariant under two by two linear transformations, and it's invariant under translations. So areas and volumes are invariant, even though distances are not. Okay? Actually, I cannot resist making this uh, comment. Sorry, this is a little aside. Uh, so we're not talking about metric notions, but I want to, uh, I, I can't resist doing it. Sorry, this is a, a small aside. Let's go back to P2. Let's go back to P2 and look at the hierarchy of symmetries that we had. So we had SL3. I can, that's pure P3. If I fix a line at infinity, this breaks you down to SL2 cross translations. All right? Now, what else can you do? How can we further reduce the, uh, how can we further reduce the symmetry? Well, I can take this line at infinity. This is L at infinity. And I can say, let me further mark two points on that line. I can call the, 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 the two points, you know, I and J, right? So now I've even further reduced the asymmetry. OK, so what do you think we've reduced the asymmetry to now, having further marked two points? We don't have full two by two linear transformations anymore. So if I further fix I and J, it's actually the 1 plus 1 Poincaré symmetry. So we have translations, and we have rotations, but they're actually boosts. Okay? There's actually a metric. There is a 1, 1 Minkowski metric, uh, which is the subset of all these SL3 transformations that not only leave infinity invariant, but leave the, these two points at infinity invariant. And what do we think of those two points at infinity? Now we can think in terms of 1 plus 1 dimensional Minkowski space. And these points at infinity are where light rays moving left go to infinity, and where right rays moving right go to infinity. One of them is i, and the other one's j. Right? So this is what Klein did. And this is what Klein, how, how Klein uh, 
uh, rationalize these different kinds of uh, geometries is to think about them as this hierarchy of symmetry breaking patterns. And this is a particularly degenerate case of asking for something further to be fixed. Here I, I said in the language of two points on the line at infinity, you can more generally ask for a fixed conic at infinity. And depending on whether that conic is hyperbolic or parabolic, you get anti de Sitter or de Sitter space as the, the two dimensional version. Okay? So those were the hyperbolic, and those were the, the uh, geometries that they. Uh, that they were, they were thinking about back then. So that's how we understood that all these things have to be consistent because they all lived inside a projective space with different Higgsings <laughs> down to subgroups. What's amusing, of course, is that he didn't say Minkowski space. He didn't say this, at least as far as I know, in, in print. He, if you do this absolutely dumbest thing, you do real points, real projective space, what you get is one comma one signature. <laughs> in this space, right? So you really see you go down to a one, one comma one signature. And there's lots of very pretty exercises that you can in interpret various boost invariances, cross ratios in this space, and so on. It's just all very, very pretty and nice. Um, but of course, he was more interested in Euclidean geometry. <laughs> and to do Euclidean geometry, you actually have to make these points complex. <laughs> Everything has got to be complex, and you've got to make the points i and j complex. One i and one minus i in some, uh, uh, so zero one i and zero one minus i. <laughs> as the two points at infinity. That reduces you from the, uh, from the SL3C all the way down to an SO2, right, of the usual uh, uh, Euclidean space. But this is one of many, many examples that we're going to see over and over in the rest of this course, that when we do real geometry, we are as Lorentzian as possible. We have as much symmetry between space and time as possible. So here we see that you do the dumbest, most natural thing in real projective space, and you get down to 011. <laughs> you get down to Minkowski space. And the things we're doing later, when everything is real, we're going to be doing physics in 2 comma 2 signature, not 3 comma 1. It's even, it treats time and space on as symmetric a footing as possible, and that's somehow related to reality um, uh, in, this, uh, in this interesting way, even if it's not reality in that interesting way. <laughs> okay, so. All right. Okay, and end, end, end of aside, sorry. So. Oh, you could ignore that. But let's go back to the notion of volume. So uh, the notion of volume is an affine notion. It's not a projective notion. It's an affine notion. So we can't actually do it in projective space. But we can do it if you give me a line at infinity, or a hyperplane at infinity in general, something with a lower index. Then we can talk about a volume. Okay? So, so, so let's, let's first talk about it in the, in the context of an area of a triangle. So, you guys remember the formula for an area of a triangle uh, from, uh, from school. If someone hands you the vertices x1, x2, and x3, then what is the formula for the area? Ignoring the, uh, it can be positive or negative. Well, a nice way of writing it is like x1 minus x3 cross x2 minus x3. Right, that's the formula for the area, forget the half. And well, an even nicer way of writing it that you might have remembered is 1x1. This determinant, you stack them together into a 3 by 3 matrix, and you take that, that determinant. Okay, so that's doing the same thing. All right, but now, now, that we're, uh, now that we're projective people, let's interpret this as, as a formula in projective geometry. Right? Well, that 1 means, of course, I have to have some, some plane at infinity some light infinity in this case. So what is this formula? Well, obviously, each one of these is some x. So I have some capital X1, capital X2, capital X3. Beautiful. That's that minor that we know and love. But this can't be the answer, because it has a weight under rescaling x1, x2, and x3. So anything we do should have no weight under rescaling x1, x2, and x3. OK, but I know what to do. I just divide by L infinity dot x1. L infinity dot x2, L infinity dot x3. OK? And now that is something which, given a line infinity, makes sense. It's invariant under the subgroup that leaves the line fixed. And it has units. The units it inherits are the units from the line infinity, right? So, so it all makes, makes perfect sense. So this is the formula for the area of a triangle, and more generally, if you give me a bunch of, uh, if, 
in any number of dimensions. You give me some x1 through xn divided by L infinity dot x1 dot L infinity dot xn is the volume of a simplex in any number of dimensions. OK? Now, let's say someone instead hands you not the vertices. Let's go back to a, to a triangle. Let's say someone doesn't hand you the vertices of a triangle. So here's, uh, but they hand you the edges instead. So I don't know, let's call the edges uh, A, B, and C. So I have my line infinity, L infinity. Now, what's the area of this triangle? Okay, and now, of course, we can, in principle, go back, determine what the vertices are, shove in the formula, and so on. But let's use our, uh, use our, um, our new attitude. So what is this? I know in terms of the vertices, it has to be L dot x1. So here would be some x1, x2, x3. But what is x1? x1 is where the lines A and B intersect. x2, and so, so clearly, there's going to be a denominator that looks like 1 over L infinity a, B, L infinity, B, C, L infinity, C, A, downstairs. OK? And upstairs, it's going to have something that looks like A, B, C squared. Has to be squared upstairs because, again, of weights. Now downstairs, everything occurs twice, so we have everything squared. All right? So this is a projective way of talking about uh, areas and volumes. Okay, very nice, projective way of talking about areas and volumes. Yes? Yeah, exactly. Because what you're doing is like slicing exactly the same space in with different choices of plane. You know, they would like literally look different, right? They would always look like the, the, the same shape, but they would have uh, 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 the coordinates would be different as you move, move, move things around, and, and, the, and the volume would be different. Okay. Yes? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, no. Well, so we, we can, we, yeah. Uh, yes. In fact, uh, uh, I probably won't get to do it right now, but next time, or not literally, but anyway, next time when, when, when I'm here, we'll talk about uh, a little bit more in projective space, forms, integration, and so on. So there's a notion of a form that you can integrate for, for any old shape. But it should be obvious, because I can triangulate anything in terms of a bunch of little shapes and add up these formulas for all of them. All right. Now, all I want to do now, um, so we'll do a, a little more next time, but all I want you to do is stare at this formula just for a second. So this is the area of a triangle, right? Now let's say I, I'm interested in an area of a simplex in four dimensions. What, what, what would that depend on? Well, a triangle has three indices. A simplex in three dimensions would have four indices. A simplex in four dimensions would have five indices, right? So what would that be? So let's say I wanted to write down, I don't know, let me just give it this symbol. Let's say I have five indices, five x's, and I want to know what is the volume of the simplex in five dimensions. Well, where, where, I've, given those, uh, where I've given the edges, well, this is given by a, b, c, d, e to the fourth over some L infinity a, b, c, d, and so on. Last one. L infinity E A B C. Now I write this formula down because last time when we talked about momentum twisters, and I just I kind of pulled it out of a hat, I told you what the, what the answer ended up being. But I told you that when you're writing the simplest MHV amplitudes in terms of momentum twisters and super momentum twisters that they had this, this expression that looked like 1, 2, 3, 4, a to 5, plus dot dot, to the fourth, this was a delta 4, over 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 1, 2, 3. Okay, so these things on the face of it, they have absolutely nothing to do with each other, except if you remember, it was peculiar that these objects satisfied identities that looked exactly as if there were simplices in four dimensions. Right? I remember that six term identity they satisfied that we said is exactly as if it was just some fact, some identity, but as if there were simplices in, in four dimensions. Well, the formulas look kind of similar. Right? 
something to the fourth involving some anti-symmetric combination of five things. A, B, if I expanded this determinant out in terms of some fifth row, it would look like A, A, B, C, D plus cyclic to the fourth. And the denominators are exactly the same, except there's this funny extra little L infinity sitting there. Okay? Um, and in fact, we're going to see this is a completely precise connection. And these amplitudes are literally volumes. Okay? And, uh, and that these formulas are actually cutting up some geometric object in different ways. So, uh, but, um, but you would not see any of it <laughs> if we were not familiar with these kind of uh, ways of thinking about um, uh, these basic geometric notions in uh, projective space. All right, so um, next time we'll talk about forms on uh, projective space and Grassmannians. So we'll spend some time talking about Grassmannians, which are just little extensions of uh, projective space. Grassmannians, forms on Grassmannians, and after we're comfortable with some of these things, we'll return to uh, we'll return to a physics. All right, thank you. <laughs>